Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, give me a high sign if I'm okay. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Ed Turnan, and I am the co-founder with my wife Mary of Song for Charlie. Um, Mary, you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today um, and wanting to learn more about fentanyl in this crazy time that we're living in this fentanyl age. Um, so we really appreciate you attending this very important webinar. Um, our son, Charlie, our youngest son, Charlie, died uh, May 2020 uh, from a counterfeit um, poisonous pill. Um, Charlie's death spurred Mary and I to, to start Song for Charlie um, with the idea that we wanted to warn kids and parents about this new danger of counterfeit prescription pills made of fentanyl. Um, today, we're going to take you through a presentation uh, for, you know, National Drug and Alcohol Facts Week. Um, we want to tell you what's going on and uh, and what you all can do about it. We're, we're very pleased that there are a number of educators who are on uh, the webinar this evening. Um, and we uh, look forward to hearing back from you and getting you engaged in helping us spread the word to uh, families all across the US. Uh, the first thing I want to do is introduce the team and the presenters uh, for this evening. And I think I'll start with John and Jennifer. You guys want to say hello? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm Jen Epstein, and this is my husband, John. And we joined Song for Charlie after losing our 18-year-old son, Cal, in December of 2020. Cal was a pretty typical teenager, uh, still trying to figure out life. He was very involved in school, uh, in the theater program. He uh, was a lifeguard and a swim instructor. Uh, loved being with people, did a great job of balancing work and school, uh, had a pretty typical um, high school career. At the end of his senior year in high school, we learned that he was uh, using marijuana and that he, he told us that he was using it to uh, manage anxiety and an eating disorder. So we got him professional help and uh, thought he was in a good path and sent him off to school. When he came home from school uh, the, at Christmas time and during the holidays of his freshman year, he was home for a few days uh, when we found him unresponsive in his bed with a few pills next to him. We had um, we were shocked. We um, had never heard about fentanyl uh, until the, the police officer at the scene looked at a couple of pills that were beside him and, and said that these are M. 30s, um, most likely they're counterfeit and most likely they're filled with fentanyl. And he, he told us that if we were the praying type of people that we should begin to pray. Um, though we got Cal to the hospital and were able to, um, to you know, get him help, he, he never recovered and he, he passed away a few days later. Um, and that is when we start our, started our journey. Uh, we quickly realized that uh, this is a problem that most of America isn't talking about, and we need to be. So we appreciate your being here and helping us to, to get the word out and just for um, making an effort to learn what's going on. I think we're going to pass it off to Laura now. Thanks, Jen and John. Uh, my name is Laura Didier. I tragically lost my 17 year old son, Zachary, just about a week after um, the Epstein's lost their beloved Cal. Zach was, as I mentioned, only 17. He was a high school senior. He was a straight A student. He had starred in the school musical. He was an athlete on the track team and, and on the soccer team. He was just a really wonderful, happy young man. Um, we found that, um, when he passed away, uh, we were very shocked. We had never, just like the Epstein's, we'd never heard, and the Trinans had never heard of these counterfeit pills. Um, when the first responders came uh, because Zach's father found him, um, it was tragically too, too late uh, for any help 
for Zach. So um, the investigation began right away. There were no drugs in his room or any evidence of why he would be deceased. Um, it wasn't until we were able to get the, uh, his phone to the detectives that we were able to see that he had purchased um, what had been marketed to him as a Percocet pill. He was in the middle of um, applying to colleges. He was very competitive for some really top rated schools. Um, and it sounds like he just wanted to, to blow off a little stress, relax um, in the middle of that. Um, he did not have a history um, with abusing drugs or alcohol. So it was very out of character. Um, and once we did determine, you know, what had happened, we were connected, we got connected very quickly with Ed and Mary, um, who um, with Song for Charlie were able to provide us with so many great resources to help us understand what had had ended our son's life. And, and like the Ternans and the Epsteins, just really wanting to jump in to educate the community around what's happening. Krista, will you introduce yourself quickly? Thanks. Hi, my name is Krista Fierabend and I'm the Director of Digital Content and Strategy. I create all of the social media content and run all of the platforms. Thank you, Krista. Um, Krista is really a big part of our success on social media. Uh, which is a major part of our, our strategy. So in general, what we're trying to do at Song for Charlie is we, we kind of come up with a three-point plan. If we're going to take our message directly to young people, we need to go where they are, we need to speak their language, and hopefully get them talking to one another. So where are they? They're on social media, they're at school, and they're at home at the kitchen table. And speaking their language is social media posts, and video. This is how kids consume uh, content these days. So um, we have become kind of a communications organization. We create a lot of social media posts. We um, work to get resources in the hands of educators and also families around the country that want to make presentations and get the word out about these fake pills. Um, today, we're going to take you through some of the materials that we share with people all around the country. and. Um, we're going to start by showing a film that we've just produced. And um, we understand there's a lot of educators uh, that are on today, which is great. We'd love to get your feedback. Our intention for this film is for it to be used in um, educational uh, situations, seminars, workshops at the college and high school level. Um, we have other resources that might be more appropriate for younger uh, ages on our website, but um, we wanna start the program off with this short film, it's eight minutes long. It tells the story of what happened to Charlie and gives some context of the broader issue. And then we'll let the rest of the team take you through their presentation. Krista, why don't you go ahead and, and run the film if you don't mind, thank you. Um, I remember being so, so flustered, um, and a cop talking at me, um, and they asked me if I was his girlfriend, and I said yes. They said, are you Charlie's girlfriend? I said yes. And then I remember them asking if he took drugs, and I was, I don't know, I was flustered. I said, yeah, he, he did take some things, but he was really safe about it. We were gonna make dinner. Our housemate Caesar comes into the kitchen and like, Chuck, there's something up, something is wrong. Chuck is not okay right now. We start smacking Charlie around, moving him around at a point, blood starts coming out of his nose. We heard like, fire trucks and actually texted Charlie like, yo, what's going on at Cal Fi? And then Tommy called me in tears. And I saw people on like all of his housemates on the ground crying, um, people who are my friends. And that's when it really like kicked in. So we have some news, we have some bad news. 
happened? What's going on? Charlie died. Charlie died. What are you talking about? Charlie died. He died from pills. Charlie did not die from an overdose. Charlie was poisoned. The DEA is warning parents, keep a close eye on your child or teen's social media activities. This warning comes after investigations across the U.S. involving children dying from fentanyl overdoses. There are millions of these dangerous fake pills out there. 15,000 pounds of the highly lethal drug fentanyl this year alone. The poison that killed musicians Prince in 2016 and Tom Petty in 2017 and very nearly killed Demi Lovato in 2018. An opioid 100 times more potent than heroin. It's smuggled into the U.S. mainly from Mexico. Ruled an accident by mixed drug toxicity with fentanyl. Michael K. Williams was found dead in his New York apartment on Monday afternoon. He was a fraternity brother. He was a senior in college. He was down to party. I think he's in the range of normal. He certainly was not in the range of dependent or addicted. He thought he was getting a Percocet, and it was a counterfeit poisonous pill. There's nothing Percocet about the Percocet Charlie took. It was counterfeit, completely fake. My dad texted me, call me. And that's when I knew, like, something was wrong. When they told me it was, like, but earth share. I didn't know what to do with myself. I was just screaming and crying and getting sick. And it's like, why him, you know? I see now that nothing is worth what we experienced that day. It makes you really like sit back and think just like it could have been anyone. No high is worth the thing that I felt talking to Mama T the next day, just trying to process things together. What we've learned is it taking and, and sharing prescription pills has become normalized among young people, and social media is a place they go uh, to buy these pills without a prescription. It's just become a normal thing at colleges, and it's crazy. When you do drugs in high school, in college, you have no idea where you're getting it from. You'll hear people say, I trust this guy, like, I trust this dealer, but in reality, like, you have no idea who, he's, who the, that dealer is getting it from. Just like the fact that one pill could end your life is um, crazy, and it sucks that, like, I know for me personally, I didn't really think about that until something like this happens. We would never have imagined Charlie would have taken one darn pill and just gone. We really want to get the message out. We want to raise people's awareness about the new risks and dangers in the era in the era of fentanyl and synthetic drugs. None of the victims behind us represented here today died of an overdose, accidental or otherwise. They were poisoned. Each of them took a single pill. It's impossible to overdose. 
on a Xanax, unless it's a counterfeit made of fentanyl. These counterfeit pills out there have flooded the market. They're all fake. If you don't get a pill from your doctor, your pharmacist, you have to assume it's fake. They've pushed the legitimate ones right out of the market. So you need to warn your friends. Don't let this happen to you. Don't have your family up here next year. Fentanyl, like, the first time I ever heard that word was Charlie's death. If it could happen to Charlie, it could happen to anyone. And then one freak moment that you can't take back, it makes the biggest shockwave ever. You guys didn't create this problem, but you can solve it. The solution is in your hands. You need to tell everyone you know that this is happening. Fentanyls are everywhere and they're deadly. And with your help, you guys can make this problem literally go away. This is a solvable problem if everybody knows that it's happening. going to switch into presentation mode. It's a hard video to watch, um, but it's reality. It's reality in America today. 275 Americans are dying each day from overdoses and poisonings. That's about 11 per hour. 60% or more than 60% of those uh, people are dying from fentanyl. It's a complicated problem. It's going to take a long time to fix um, and it, it, it's gonna take uh, input from a lot of different people and organizations. And so we feel like the first step in solving this problem is awareness and making sure that everybody who um, is aware of this present, is aware of what's going on and, and shares so that, um, so that people can avoid, be educated and um, you know, basically make good choices. So where we'd like to start is just um, sharing, make sure everybody knows what is fentanyl and, and um, understand what the problem is. So fentanyl is a powerful synthetic opioid. It is uh, a legitimate pharmaceutical that was developed at, by the uh, medical community uh, for use in hospitals and doctor's offices. It has been used since the 60s, mostly for end of life care or for surgery purposes. It is hundred times more potent than morphine. It is man-made. It is not dependent on growing seasons or um, crops, anything like that. That helps to make it somewhat uh, have a somewhat of an unlimited supply or very you know easy to ramp up production quickly. And that also contributes to the uh, fact that it is um, going to be low cost because because it is easy to produce. Uh, fentanyl is one of the most powerful medicines that's being used today. When it is used, it is typically used by anesthesiologists or somebody who's very highly trained in, in the use of fentanyl. And uh, it has a very small therapeutic window. Whenever they do use it in a medical setting, they're, they're measuring in terms of micrograms. And uh, if they get it just slightly off, you know, if they give a little bit, a few micrograms more than they should, the person could overdose or perhaps die. So it is something that's, that is um, very closely monitored. And it is very addictive. Um, that contributes to part of this problem. The DEA says that there's two milligrams, uh, about two milligrams of fentanyl is enough to be a potentially um, fatal dose. And so when you think about um, micro milligrams, it's first of all, it's do dosed in micrograms in the hospital setting. Uh, two milligrams is what's potentially uh, lethal. And that is just the equivalent of a couple grains of salt. A few grains of salt is enough to kill. So. 
Fentanyl itself is, is not necessarily bad when used properly. And whenever we are talking about fentanyl in this presentation, we're not talking about pharmaceutical fentanyl. We're really talking about illicit fentanyl. And you know, you may ask, how in the world is this, this powerful drug getting into the street drug scene? Uh, Krista, next. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And to order, in order to understand what's going on, you really need to have somewhat of an understanding of the opioid epidemic, which started in the 1990s when doctors overprescribed uh, opioids, um, and their their patients would come back asking for more opioids and weren't able to get them from the doctors anymore. So some patients um, wanting to avoid the effects of withdrawal went to the street market to find these opioids. Now, in the, in the 90s, the street market was filled with pharmaceutical pills. Uh, these were pills that were diverted from the pharmaceutical companies, from pharmacies. There were people who would get, take their prescriptions, uh, go get it filled, and then sell their pills to other people. So certainly it was not an ideal situation. Uh, it was illegal, but the supply at that time uh, was predictable. There were pills that were uh, dosed uh, appropriately. You knew what you were getting. Uh, at some point, uh, I would say in the, in the early 2000s, the DEA uh, realized what was going on. A lot of people realized what was going on. The DEA and other law enforcement organizations worked hard to cut the supply and to stop the illegal uh, sales of these pharmaceuticals. And they did a really good job. And it became really hard for these opioids, for people to get these opioids on, on the street market. And that's whenever heroin started to get introduced into the, the street market. And um, at that point, the cartels realized that there's, there's an opportunity here for them. Uh, the cartels are looking for a way to make money. They saw that there was a market for these, these illegal uh, opioids, and they wanted to fill that demand. Uh, Krista, next. And so the, the cartels jumped on that opportunity. They started working uh, with manufacturers in China to get illegally made fentanyl shipped to them. And they took that illegally made fentanyl, which was perhaps not the best quality, or uh, had the best um, controls on, on the dosages. And they took that illegal fentanyl and they uh, bought pill presses, they bought fillers, they bought uh, dyes, and they created their own pills uh, out of their, their illegal manufacturing. So there's, they, they had clandestine labs uh, mostly in Mexico. Um, some of them could have even perhaps been across the border in the U.S. Uh, these labs were in people's garages, in the jungle, in a field somewhere, warehouses, and they, they stamped uh, thousands and thousands of fake pills. Now, these fake pills, to a, to a person buying them on the street, they look exactly like a pharmaceutical pill. In fact, to this day, you look at these pills and you cannot tell them, they cannot tell the difference between a pill that you get from a pharmaceutical company or from the pharmacy and a pill that uh, is illegally made in, in Mexico or other places. And this is, uh, you combine that, these, these illegal pills and, Combine that with the social media that's available today, and you've got this supercharged street market where not only is it illegal, but now you've got these deadly uh, pills that are that are on the market and being bought uh, on social media. They're being passed from friend to friend at parties. Um, they're they're being sold everywhere. Uh, so we're at the point today where, whenever you get a pill. Uh, the DEA says that 95% uh, of the pills that they've confiscated in the past year have been fake, and they um, estimate that almost all of them are made of fentanyl. Next. So you can see the effect this has had on the, the rate of overdoses and uh, poisonings in the U.S. This just is a graph that simply shows the history of all, all 
um, overdoses and poisonings for all ages since 2000. And you can see it, it was climbing steadily, but when fentanyl was introduced in the street market at around 2015, there was a dramatic increase. So, um, and as of, as of today, uh, more than 60% of overall overdoses and poisonings are contributed to um, fentanyl as a contributing factor. Next. So why we're, what we're doing today is basically um, raising an alarm. Kids are being swept up in this new problem. Uh, in the past, uh, kids historically know enough, they're educated enough, uh, warned enough to stay away from cocaine, heroin, and this powerful street drugs. And so, you know, if a kid goes out into a party or is offered uh, some of these harder drugs by a friend, they know uh, not to take it. They know the risks and they generally stay away from them. Prescription pills, however, um, are a little different. Today's youth have been grown, have grown up with pills. They're given a Xanax um, whenever they have anxiety or they're offered a Percocet after having their wisdom teeth pulled. Perhaps they have a parent who had a surgery and so they see them getting an Oxy. So they, the, the um, use of pills is something that's normalized in society today. Um, so what is new is the fact that there are these pills that look exactly like legitimate pharmaceuticals that are on the street, but instead of uh, the Xanax or Oxy or Percocet that somebody may be looking for, the people asking for these are getting something much more powerful, something that, that is you know, 50 to 100 times more powerful than heroin, and often they're dying from it. And so you know, we feel like... Um, you know, kids are kids. Teenagers, um, historically, they've been experimenting for years with drugs, and the landscape has changed, and they need to understand that, that this experimentation comes with a much higher risk than, than uh, experimentation by any other generation prior to them. And we hope that by educating people, uh, this will help people to make better choices. Next. So basically, um, so this, with the introduction of synthetic drugs and specifically, specifically fentanyl, the street drug scene has, has changed dramatically. Uh, today, we know that fentanyl is in pretty much all the opioids and benzos that are being sold in the street market today. Percocet, Oxy, Vicodin, Xanax, Valium. The DEA will tell you that that more than 95% of those pills that are, that are on the market today are, are fake and, and likely fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl is also being mixed in other drugs, heroin, cocaine, MDMA, meth. They are all regularly being found laced uh, with fentanyl. And other drugs that we, that we think are important to keep an eye out on are Adderall. Um, people are selling Adderall being made of meth. And there's also reports of uh, marijuana and vape pens being laced with fentanyl. Uh, those instances are much more rare, and we don't think this is something that is being done on a widespread basis. But people need to understand that anytime uh, somebody chooses a drug off the street, anytime that somebody chooses to take a pill that is not something that uh, is in a bottle from a pharmacy with their name on it, that they are taking a risk. Uh, recreational drug users also impacted. Um, kids, unsuspecting kids, this is something that impacts everybody. I'm going to turn it over to Laura. Thank you, Jen. Um, so this is the dynamic um, that's happening. We have this new category of victim that did not used to die um, from experimentation or recreational use. There used to be this trajectory um, where you might have a young person that either experimented, self-medicated um, with substances, and that might lead onto a path of occasional or recreational use, maybe social use, um, that could then eventually turn into someone becoming dependent or a, an habitual user, or sadly, 
potentially someone that would develop um, substance use disorder. And at the end of that long path, there might be um, the chance that they could lose their life to an accidental overdose. But in that pathway, there would be opportunities um, to, to change the behaviors back and regain a healthy path in life, you know, whether aging out of the behavior as kids get older and they're, you know, making better decisions, they have more, um, they've just grown up more and, and they're making better, better and smarter decisions for themselves or potentially they've um, had friends and family, you know, inter intervene to help them get on it back onto a better path. But unfortunately now with these pills and with the proliferation of fentanyl into the illicit drug market, someone that's just experimenting from the very beginning might encounter a lethal amount of fentanyl and lose their life. And this is what we're seeing with so many of these young victims, um, parents like myself, who didn't have an opportunity to even see red flags develop because um, a child came into contact with the lethal amount of fentanyl so early on in this experimental phase. And that's why so many of us who have lost um, children that fall into this new category of victim really want to be a part of the solution, you know, to educate other families about what's going on and, and to show that it, it really can happen to any family. Next slide. So this is just a sampling of some of the beautiful young faces that have been lost to this. Um, my son, Zach, you can see him in the top corner. Um, he, uh, as you can see in, in his little introduction there, um, three, three months after he passed away, we got his college acceptance letters. Um, as I mentioned, it was kind of in that period of time um, applying for college and I think you know, wanting to just kind of de-stress a little bit um, that he came upon um, trying a Percocet. And uh, after he passed away, we, we received all of his acceptance letters, including to UCLA. But all of these beautiful young people have, have wonderful stories, so much potential, so, so much that they were robbed of because they came in contact with fentanyl um, that they didn't even know was present in these counterfeit pills that they were taking. Next slide. Thank you, Laura. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Okay, great. Um, hi, I'm John Epstein. Um, I was sitting earlier next to Jennifer um, as she described what happened to our son Cal. I'm gonna take a few minutes to walk you through a little bit of what we're seeing from a data perspective. Um, Drug deaths have grown at an exponential rate for 40 years. This chart shows 20 of those years. I'll come back to the topic of exponential, but basically it means that uh, drug deaths have grown on a percentage basis um, every year. What this chart shows is the year over year or annual growth of drug deaths by different age groups. Um, on the whole, drug deaths have grown by about 7% every year across this time period. In 2020, something dramatic happened. Now, just about all age groups increased, but we saw that our youngest ages, 10 to 19 year olds, grew the most, and not just by a little bit, but by quite a lot, as you can see there. We also saw that uh, the top two age groups, if you looked at it from a five-year age perspective, uh, were also included our youngest ages, um, the college age groups. So, when you see an outlier like this over 20 years, you have to ask yourself, well, is it an outlier or is it the start of a new trend? And in order to do that, you need to look at, well, what is driving that number? So what drives a drug death? Well, uh, basically there's a supply and demand situation. How many uh, drugs are there and how many are available and how lethal are they uh, is the supply end. As Jennifer described, there's over, I think, something like 20 million pills in the marketplace today and the DEA says four out of 10 have a potentially lethal dose and the average dose is two milligrams or the amount that is potentially lethal for a naive user. So clearly the number, the amount of supply that could be driving drug deaths has gone up, but it's gone up for everybody. 
from a demand perspective, then is are people using these drugs more? And then there's other mitigating factors such as COVID um, and other things. So everybody experienced COVID. Um, all other mitigating factors might be the same. The question is, are kids using drugs more or what is driving this? Next. So it's almost like we should put this slide first. Um, this is, um, there is a profound knowledge gap in teenagers and in young adults. Uh, there is a gold standard survey of uh, youth drug behavior, uh, which is called Monitoring the Future. It's run by the University of Michigan, uh, sponsored by um, National Institute of, of Drug Abuse. Um, there's another one called the uh, National Survey of Drug Use. That's a SAMHSA survey rather than a NIH survey. These surveys tell us that drug use was down in 2020. So the demand equation doesn't actually answer the question. The problem with those surveys, and they are great surveys, um, they are the gold standard. They're longitudinal over many years. Um, and so it, they don't change quickly. They don't change as fast as the drug market is changing. Uh, the introduction of synthetics have left those surveys behind and they don't ask questions like, uh, what do you know about counterfeit pills? Or what's your perception of risk in uh, an oxy that you buy on the street? Um, or they don't even ask what is fentanyl or do you know much about fentanyl? Because most kids don't. So drug use is down, but kids, don't know about counterfeit pills. So while there is a huge increase in the supply of potentially lethal synthetic opioids disguised as counterfeit pills, kids don't know. They're stressed. They turn to prescription medicine, which is very normalized, as Jennifer described. They don't really know what fentanyl is. Um, and they basically have three quarters of them have not heard of fentanyl and counterfeit pills. Um, when asked how dangerous is fentanyl, this is for teenagers, they rate it about as dangerous as cigarettes. Yet they're dying at 14 times the rate they're dying from heroin. So as Jennifer mentioned, their use rates of heroin and cocaine are not high, um, but they don't know that the pills that they are taking in involve fentanyl and the risk that's associated with that potentially lethal dose. Okay, next. And so the result of that is we have extreme growth um, of death in our youth. You could see this uh, fentanyl involved death growth, um, 169%, that's, um, that's almost three times um, in one year. Um, this is about 5,000 youth under the age of 24 years. And you can see that they massively exceed the deaths of all other age groups. So um, it is disproportionately affecting our youth. Um, and potentially, uh, we are challenged. One of the reasons that we're challenged with the awareness idea is that out of 100,000 deaths, which was itself, uh, I think, 30% increased um, year over year, um, the relatively small number of teenagers and young adults that die um, maybe don't get the attention um, that the rest of the population do. The largest populations that die from drug overdose are in those middle years, uh, maybe between 30 and 40. Um, but the fastest growing by far demographic it, it are these younger ages. Um, the thing about coming back to exponential growth, the thing about exponential growth is um, it has a way of sneaking up on you. If, for example, everybody in this webinar tonight, and let's say we have 500 here, um, if everybody uh, told um, 1.5, six, nine people um, about uh, this situation, um, it representing the 169%, and they did that each day. Um, and those people in turn told 1.69 people. Uh, in four days, we'd have told 10,000 people about this problem. And in eight days, we'd have told a million people. So um, while the numbers are relatively small of youth that are dying, um, if the growth rates don't slow down, then pretty soon those numbers are going to be um, rather large. Okay, next. And another indicator that fentanyl disproportionately affects youth is this chart, which shows that 
for each age group, um, the percent of their drug deaths that involve fentanyl. And so I believe Jennifer mentioned that um, on in total for the United States, 60% uh, of drug overdose deaths involve fentanyl. But for youth, it's actually quite a bit higher. And for that just going to college or just past high school age, it's the highest of all. Um, and the teenagers are not very far behind and that's over 70% of those deaths. So not only do practically all of the drug deaths of our younger folks involve fentanyl, um, but all the other drugs on the street are contaminated with fentanyl. For example, 85% uh, of youth deaths that involve cocaine also contain fentanyl. Um, and those statistics are similar for heroin or benzos or meth, a little bit lower than the cocaine number, but all drugs um, either contain fentanyl and or we have a significant polysubstance overdose problem going on where more than one drug is being taken at a time. Um, and for the younger ages, we highly suspect those are not choices to have polysubstance deaths, but uh, lacings, contaminations, or the fake pills, which you know technically are not laced pills. Um, they are fentanyl-filled pills. Uh, I believe uh, Charlie's death, Lo uh, uh, Zach's death, and Cal's death, none had an actual measurement of Percocet or Oxy in the toxicology report. It was only fentanyl. Um, so th those pills are not laced. They're 100% fentanyl and filler. Um, okay, next. So to wrap up this portion uh, of what we learned, there is a flood of fentanyl and other synthetics that have ra radically changed the US street drug slash meta street medicine landscape. Um, this includes our fake uh, prescription pills that are made only of fentanyl, as well as widespread contamination and lacing of other illicit substances. Now, as Laura mentioned, youth experimentation is common. It's been common since the invention of the kid. Um, Self-medication, it happens, and with this generation and COVID, we believe that might be happening a little bit more. And the taking of pills in our society is very normalized. It's low stigma, and it's easy to do and easy to access. So when you put those things together, you have a perfect storm. We have a new category of younger, more naive, and opioid naive, um, and less or not substance-dependent victims that have emerged. While this group of victims is a, small, a smaller relative portion of the entire 100,000, it is the demographic that is growing the fastest and will continue to unless action is taken. Getting to action, um, you know, human nature is that we tend to rely on what we know and what our history has been. The historical perspective of many of us has been built over the 20 years of the opioid epidemic and the problems that that has created. Therefore, we have focused a lot of our energy around a substance dependent population that's older and or, uh, or end, there is a stigma associated with a quote overdose uh, versus the poisonings that many of these are that has made people reluctant to speak out. And therefore the recognition of this problem that we're talking about tonight has been slow. Grassroot organizations like Song for Charlie have been pushing for greater awareness and action at federal, state, and local levels. All of the Ternans and the Didiers and ourselves, as well as many volunteers and some that I see are on the line, have engaged with their school districts and their states, um, you know, county and, and federal agencies. And all the doors have opened, people are listening, but it is very slow going. So while the going is slow to raise the awareness of this problem, the youth out there and their supports, their families, their teachers uh, don't know. And what that means is we are in a situation with unparalleled continued injury, death, and tragedy that will continue to grow until changes are made. Thank you. We're going to switch, I believe, back to Laura. Thank you, John. I appreciate all, all of that data is so important. And so that really brings us to our mission here at Song for Charlie, uh, which is getting that educated education out into the community. All of us here, um, we do speak to students, we speak to 
community groups and teacher groups. And, and what we like you know, to, to tell the youth is to really be mindful of their, their mental health, their overall wellness, to be able to point them to the healthy ways that they can cope with that stress because it is real. We really need to remind our youth that that we care about them, um, you know, that their that their health is very vital and important to us, and not to dismiss the stressors that they that they share with us, and that they need to to educate themselves on what is happening, on what these risks are, and really the onus is is on us as their caretakers and their teachers and their community leaders to provide them with that accurate information. And um, we also want to make sure that the youth understand what is going on with these counterfeit pills. And so that they do understand that if they feel that anything that they're going through might require medical attention, medication, that they understand the proper channels to do that. And that going on to social media, taking something from a friend um, cannot, can no longer be trusted because the counterfeits are everywhere. We want kids talking to each other. Ultimately, we would really like for this to be peer led. Um, Zach's friends were so devastated as with all of our children, uh, children's friends, as you saw in that video, because this was not a danger that they knew about. So we really want when we're speaking to kids to encourage them, you know, talk to your friends, even if it's a friend you never think, you know, I mean, Zach was somebody that none of his friends would have thought he would have um, tried something like this, but just to make sure those conversations are out there amongst the peer groups and to just to ask for help. We need to destigmatize, you know, mental health issues and, and let kids know that they're where their safe spaces are for them to go for help. Next slide. And for parents, it's so important that we all understand that it is a different landscape now. And, and we cannot assume that this might not touch our family. Um, learning about the difference with these synthetic drugs, with the endless supply, as Jen had mentioned, now that we are seeing these things being produced in a lab, to, to have these open conversations, if you, if you sense any struggle you know, with your children, even if it seems like a typical youthful struggle, um, to make sure that they understand what's going on uh, with these counterfeit pills, with the way uh, our kids are being targeted on social media with ads and things like that um, to entice them to try what is being marketed as a quote unquote safe medication. Um, encourage your schools and communities to get this education in front of young people. There's a lot of very creative ways that we've we've presented this information in our local community. I'm in the Sacramento, California area, in a suburb of Sacramento, and we've we've seen some really interesting and um, compelling ways that schools have engaged with us to educate their students and get them involved and just get help quickly. If you suspect there might be any kind of experimentation going on, on with your child, time is of the essence. Um, make sure that you are getting this information in front of them so they can make a better informed decision and stay safe. And next slide. Is that to you, Ed? I think it must be, Laura. <laughs> um, thanks everyone. Um, that brings us to the end of our presentation. And I just wanna thank uh, John and Jen Epstein and Laura for putting themselves out there, for telling their personal stories. Um, none of us expected to be in this world. And um, there are parents out there who found themselves in the same situation that, that, that we are in, who have, are doing similar work all around the country. And we want to acknowledge that. This problem is new. And people that have been in this world in either law enforcement or harm reduction or drug education demand reduction, we talk to people from all stakeholder groups and they are all scared to death because of this fentanyl and the practice of counterfeiting. 
Everyone knows that if people don't know what they're putting in their body, they're at much higher risk. So families like the Epsteins and, and, and the Didiers and the Turnans, we are putting ourselves out there to spread this word all around the country as fast as we can. And this problem is gonna be solved from the grassroots up, we believe. We believe that's what it's gonna take. Now, I would ask all of you what you can, what you can do to help with this is first you can, you can follow us on social media. Please subscribe to our newsletter. I can tell you that 2022 is finally gonna be a, a year where the public awareness in the United States is going to, it's gonna increase. There are th some things coming in the next few months on the national level uh, that are finally going to bring this topic into the forefront where it's belonged for a long time. And people who've been working on this for years are finally going to, to see this subject be in the headlines. Um, so follow us for more news on that. Um, if you're interested in the film that we showed, um, we put a link to where you can uh, sign up to receive that film. We just want to know who you are, know who's downloading it. Um, we encourage you to sign up and, and show the film and give us some feedback. Uh, we'll also be sending out a, uh, a survey, a very short survey about this webinar. We'd love to hear what you think, get your suggestions about how we can improve our messaging um, any way possible. Um, so I think that's it. We have been um, taking uh, some questions in the Q&A. Um, we're at about an hour now. Um, there are a couple of questions coming in um, that I can take for a few minutes if people want to hang out. Um, the first one that I see, uh, are there any new synthetics that are showing up in the drug supply? And the answer to that question, sadly, is yes. Um, there are, uh, the people that we talk to stress that the, the drug traffickers have figured out that synthetics, because of their, um, the fact that you can make as much as you need to meet the demand um, is a better mousetrap for drug traffickers. And synthetics are not going to go away. Um, what we say in some of our presentations to, to students is that there's two things they're going to have to cope with uh, in this new drug landscape. One is stress, unprecedented level, levels of stress and anxiety, and the other is synthetics. Uh, those two things, they're going to have to learn to cope with those two things. And they have to learn healthy coping skills because turning to the street for relief uh, by popping a pill or any other kind of substance has never been more dangerous. Um, uh, there's a family of synthetic opioids called nitazines or nitazines uh, that have be begun showing up in various uh, analogs. And uh, we think those are just the first in uh, what will be a series of um, other synthetics. Um, one of the things that's going on is that the proliferation of people who are uh, in the business of synthesizing drugs is, is just exploding. So you've got a bunch of amateur, amateur chemists out there trying different combinations of things. So people are dying from heroin that has not only fentanyl, but also a horse tranquilizer called xylazine in it because fentanyl takes you up really fast and then wears off really fast and xylazine, what they said, what they call gives, gives the hit legs. So the drug supply is really like a chemical soup these days. It's not organic and plant-based anymore. It's synthetic. And there's kind of these mad scientists, you know, amateur alchemists creating these brews and essentially using the US drug consumer as lab rats. It's, it's really that bad. Um, so that's that answer. We will definitely share the link. We put the link into the um, chat box. Okay, so we got that. I think I'm out of questions. Anybody else from the panel want to say anything in closing? Ed, there's there's one question I saw in the in the chat, which is a common question. I heard Laura and Chris answer at a presentation this morning. Uh, the one about why would drug dealers sell these things if their clients are, or customers are killed. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, and the answer to that is that most of the time they don't kill their customers. Um, and it's really a numbers game. 
Uh, we estimate that um, there are hundreds of millions, several hundred million counterfeit prescription pills floating around in the United States of America on the street market at any given time. Um, and if it, let's take an example of like a 10,000 pill batch. If someone presses out 10,000 pills uh, and say, you know, the problem is improper mixing. That's what's killing people. So let's say that 100 of those 10,000 pills are complete duds. They didn't get any fentanyl into that part of the batch at all. And 100 of them on the other end are overloaded with fentanyl and would kill three adults, right? Well, the deadly pills are still a fraction of that 10,000 pill batch. The ones in the middle, they have, the drug trafficker has made a lot of money and has some satisfied customers and potentially has some repeat customers. A hundred or so deaths is just breakage to this drug trafficker. And it is just the cost of doing business. Uh, but the vast majority of the people who buy and consume these pills do not die, right? But when you take that number, uh, that percentage or that, you know, you know the, the percentage of hot pills in any given batch of pressed pills, and you multiply that by three to 500 million pills on the market in the US, that's where you get the thousands of young people dying from counterfeit pills. Is that okay, John? You want to add anything? No, I think you nailed it. Economics. Right. Okay, so we are right at five o'clock. Um, so, okay, so again, a question about uh, social media and uh, and kids getting pills on social media. Is there anything that can be done? Um, it's kind of controversial, this topic. Um, the social media platforms from our experience, and we've engaged with them, we talk to them, we actually work with them. We have, um, they are helping us get our message out by giving us a lot of ad credits. And we are in contact with um, the trust and safety people and the, um, uh, the, the kind of the people helping us on the awareness side, the content people at all of the major social media platforms. That's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube. We're, we're dealing with all of them because that's where young people get their message. So it's a double-edged sword. The dealers in our mind and, and the platform people agree with this. Those are the bad guys. They are using this platform, these social media platforms to distribute these pills. So when, if you read Sam Quinones' book, uh, Dreamland, about the beginning of the opioid crisis back in the 90s and 2000s, you, you come to realize that drug dealers will always use the most the current technology to distribute their goods. And in those days, it was the pager. So. Snapchat and other social media platforms really are just the modern day pager. Um, so in terms of holding them quote unquote accountable legally, they have the protections that all, of, that all internet companies um, enjoy of uh, being able to make the case that they are not ultimately liable for interactions between two individuals on their platform. That whatever culpability lies between the two people transacting whatever business that is. And we're not going to get around that law anytime soon. So just like we say, while society is figuring out the response to this problem, Song for Charlie is going to go warn the kids in the meantime, we take the same tack with social media, right? We, it's going to take a while for, for legislators and social media companies to figure out whether there's going to be changes in the liability laws. In the meantime, we're going to work with the platforms because that's where the kids are. And we are reaching millions of, of, of young people with our message by partnering with the social media companies actively. Good question. Thank you. That's a complicated issue. A lot of this is complicated and there are a lot of different stakeholders involved. We kind of stand for the idea that the practice of counterfeiting in the environment where highly potent synthetics have hit the, the, the market um, calls for all stakeholders from the supply reduction side 
basically law enforcement, demand reduction people, education, and harm reduction people, right? Safe supply legalization for all of those people to start talking to one another, to sit around the same table and figure out a new approach because there are very new and dangerous dynamics when you combine counterfeiting with super potent synthetics. That's what we're up against now. So as that all starts to come together, we, we'd love to get your help to, to warn the kids. So with that, everyone, uh, that's the end of the um, questions. We appreciate everybody being here. We are at 5.04, just about an hour. We're all very proud of ourselves for doing this in 60 minutes. Um, and we thank you very much for your support. Please follow us and give us your feedback. And we look forward to working with you in the months to come. Thanks, everyone. And thank you to our team. Could, we wouldn't be here without you all. Thanks, thank you for team. your presentations today. And thank you, Krista. Great job, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.